1995, I made a friend on the internet. We met through a shared love of Italy. I have a house there and get away to it whenever I can. I discovered he was a Canadian professor of art history and he spent the summer in Rome nearly every year. His name was Glenn Scott and I got to know him, as did all of us on the CompuServe Italian forum, from the messages that he posted there, which were about a variety of things and all of it written with huge enthusiasm and excitement. He loved every part of life. He loved food, he loved sex, he loved churches, he loved the Renaissance. And he wrote about it with flair and intelligence and always with humour. The internet is supposed to make life easier for people and it certainly does for me. I use it every day to keep in touch with friends. In Glenn's case, I think it made his death easier too. Although the first time we communicated using the internet, it was rather a mundane matter about my house in Italy. Here was somebody with a place in Tuscany, and of course, it immediately caught a lot of our attention. She actually let this place out for free all winter. I did approach her, that perhaps someday, and so on and so forth. And she wrote back and said she only took couples. And that actually pissed me off. And I thought, how dare you judge me like that? And uh, I'd be perfectly happy living there on my own, and I'm sure I'd make friends with half of uh, the village she lives in. And, uh, uh, but anyway, I didn't tell her I was pissed off at her. And uh, now that I know Mary much better, uh, she may not have minded. Today, Glenn Scott is dead. During the short time that I knew him, he was diagnosed as having a terminal illness and spent a year knowing that his life was coming to an end. But in that last year of life, he showed a courage and a vitality that nothing could dim. On learning of his diagnosis, it was motor neurone disease, known as ALS in North America, Glenn asked his doctor how long he had to live. He said without hesitation, uh, the next six months will be your best. And by this time next year, you probably will not want to be around. So uh, I went home from, from that appointment and immediately called my travel agent. Uh, there wasn't any question in my, my mind at all of what I wanted to do. I had to go to Rome. <laughs> oh. That had been a fear all summer. That I wouldn't get back. <sighs> These uh, remembered emotions are very strong. Uh, perhaps we can talk about saying goodbyes. I had a lot of practice there in the last six months too. And uh, I've learned uh, a lot, I think. Uh, not, I haven't learned an easy way, so don't hold your breath. But uh, I've learned about making it easier for me and it involves remembered emotions. And uh, certainly I avoid burning images in my brain of people walking outdoors. <laughs> I, uh, I don't do that anymore. In teaching about the Italian Renaissance, Glenn had fallen in love with Rome. He took his own video camera around the city and captured its architecture and art on tape to illustrate his classes. If he had to die, it was images like these that he wanted to be his last. 
but he also knew that he didn't want to let the disease run its course, with his faculties declining one by one as time ran out. That left only one choice. I intend to take my life, um, but I must be able to do it myself. And I must do it without implicating anyone else. Uh, the laws simply do not allow uh, for disabled people uh, to uh, kill themselves. It was an irony of Glenn's situation that long before contracting a terminal illness, he'd become interested in euthanasia through his friend Mary Forsythe. I don't know specifically, but I think Glenn and I have been in agreement about having a choice uh, long before he ever uh, became ill. So I think it was very early on after his diagnosis that it just became a natural part of our conversation to uh, include his plans. I am truly sorry that the situation is such that those of us that really care um, cannot be with him right at the end, you know? It'd be nice to have some Bach and a glass of Shivas and kind of celebrate that part of it too, you know, but that's not, that's not possible today. To decide on the best way to die, Glenn turned to his computer. I had to go searching the internet and found a book, found euthanasia societies, which uh, I knew had existed, but I certainly hadn't uh, looked at them before, and, uh, and found out that, yes, there is a book that uh, is a kind of how-to and, uh, and what to do it with and uh, what not to do it with, which is even more important. And uh, even this book has not been available very long. And uh, so if I hadn't been on the internet, didn't know how to go hunting for these kinds of things, um, Obviously, there are a lot of people who end up in this kind of situation, not just with ALS, who really don't know where to turn. Glenn found a recipe for a collection of pills that would kill him quickly and painlessly, and he set about gathering the ingredients. In the autumn of 1997, Glenn cashed in his pension and life insurance, sold his house in Canada, and planned to set off on his last trip to Europe. Within the space of a few weeks, as Glenn made his plans, he had a lot to learn about his new status as a person of disability. One of the things that I thought I was going to need is something that's called a leg bag, uh, which is something to collect urine that you strap onto your leg, and uh, it is attached to your penis by a kind of condom-like thing that has a tube. Well, I'd never bought one of these before, and, uh, and I couldn't go and do it myself. And uh, so I phoned the drugstore and had a discussion, got a young woman, it's always a bright young woman at the other end, and, and so I said, well, I've never bought any of these before, how do they come? And she said, well, half a liter, three quarters of a liter. And I said, no, I'm not particularly interested in the bag. It's the other end. And, uh, and she said, well, will those come in small, medium, and large? And, uh, and I said, well, you better send me large. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, she said, we sell a lot of these, and most people buy a medium and a large, and off they go. And she said, nine times out of ten, they come back and order the medium. And I said, well, I still think you, you should send me the large. And she says, well, congratulations. While I was talking with the travel agent, the lady from the drugstore was calling me and left a message. Uh, because I could actually talk and receive a message at the same time. 
And the lady had said, uh, in spite of our discussion, I <laughs> sent you medium. <laughs> Off we went with medium. There was no choice. And uh, arrived in England, tried one of these things on, and it was like sort of the Boston Strangler gotten a hold of you. So uh, definitely medium was not the answer. He thought of anything that might prevent him from making the most of the trip including the possibility that his deteriorating signature might present problems when he came to use his credit cards. So I informed the visa people and uh, then I called Corporate American Express at an 800 number or free phone I think as you would call it uh, and of course you never know where you're getting connected to. It uh, could be anywhere in the continent and I got a young woman on the other end and uh, started explaining the problem to her that I had this disease, my signature was changing and so on. And she was writing like mad. She told me she was and uh, wrote this file on my file on their computer so that it would come up if it was ever questioned. And uh, at the end of this, she said, well, you're all fixed up and you won't have any troubles with your signature and they amended my spending uh, profile, I think it's called in American Express, so that uh, I could charge up to $25,000 a month, which I thought was adequate for my needs. And, uh, and then she said a prayer. Uh, it was a prayer, and uh, I thought that was very moving. Armed with a blessing and a credit card from American Express, Glenn set off to Europe, starting in the UK. He was determined to enjoy the rest of his life in a civilized and pleasurable way with friends, food, and the best products of Europe's vineyards. Glenn had asked a friend, Tom Pierce, to accompany him to Europe and look after him, and to take video of his travels. Uh, initially, uh, when he asked me to do this, uh, he was set up in his home in Ontario, and uh, I helped him get things organized and packed back in September, October, and we left uh, November 15th. He was very exhausted, and once we arrived in England, he could barely walk. Um, you know, I was helping him with a cane, whatever. Um, after some days of rest, he bounced back. For a man facing death, Glenn showed a remarkable ability to enjoy himself in the trip across Europe, where others might have just become depressed. I can honestly say that I have not been depressed uh, over any of this time since I found out. Uh, I have pleasure every day. That's all there is. <laughs> when Glenn arrived in Rome, he found an apartment with the help of friends and settled into the regular routine he'd chosen to occupy his days for the rest of his life. Any day I can simply go out and uh, do the marketing, sit at a cafe, have a coffee, uh, do what many people in Rome do. And uh, if I can do that for a few hours, and uh, bonus is having lunch, then uh, I've had a really good day. That's why I came. There's such vitality just on the streets of Rome. I don't need sword swallowers or snake handlers to uh, make my street life interesting. Uh, another thing that endears me to Rome uh, and Italy in general was that I knew I could move here and become a part of something quickly and uh, it hasn't taken long. Uh, this neighborhood 
Cartier. Uh, it's called Prati. And, uh, well, I've been calling myself a Pratt since uh, the end of December. And, uh, um, the merchants, the people on the street market who are there every day, and uh, um, eventually even the snooty waiters at the Smartest Cafe begin to recognize you. And of course, uh, uh, my helper, and there have been several, and I are very no noticeable. And I've never seen another wheelchair. Uh, I'm not sure where they keep these people, but uh, uh, there you don't see very many of them. Glenn's appetite for enjoyment was undiminished by his growing disability. He splashed out on some of the world's best and most expensive wines and threw a party where I and his other internet friends could meet each other. Another person who got to know Glenn first on the internet was a lawyer, Giuliano Lemme. Later they met face to face. The first impression he gave me actually was a, was a very funny one because I, I, I knew how old he was and uh, I, I really was astounded by his looks and his, uh, uh, his boyish face and uh, his very uh, cheer cheerful attitude. It was actually uh, was astounding. It was a very good first impression, <laughs> really. Since he knew that I was a uh, an attorney practicing in Rome, he asked me, he asked me if I could assist him in, you know, in the, from the most trivial uh, issues uh, of bureaucracies here, bureaucracy here to some dealing to some, with some contracts, uh, with, with his will, and so on. And I, of course, said yes. Yeah, <laughs> I was very glad to be able to help. On May the 9th, 1998, Glenn returned to his apartment from one of his daily trips around his favourite quarter of Rome. He'd already lived two months beyond the six months he was given the previous year, and he believed that his quality of life would deteriorate markedly in the next month. But his plans were in place. I've already, already decided just to give myself an extra month, uh, which is probably May, <laughs> Uh, maybe a week in June or so, um, that I could ingest the drugs other than feeding them to myself. Uh, if you have to take 60 or 70 pills, it's a, it can be a tricky business. And when you've got hands like mine, it's even more difficult, uh, if not impossible. Uh, the other aspect of taking that many is that they're very bitter, so you have to mix it with something else. Uh, you also have to take another drug ahead of time to prevent you from throwing the whole thing up. And uh, so there are all these, these kinds of details. I've been doing this all along uh, as I see my abilities disappear. And the first was to uh, remove the drug from the gelatin capsules. So that was done months ago because it's much easier to mix uh, without those silly, uh, with all those capsules. Uh, the mixing I can still do and what I've decided since I'm very clumsy with a spoon now, and my wrist has, will barely hold the weight of my hand, uh, that there's a risk of fumbling it. So, but I can still drink from a straw. Uh, I tested one of the pills and the substance to see if it would dissolve. Doesn't dissolve, sinks to the bottom. So I have to make a liquid that has some substance to it, but not too much that it won't go through a straw. I bought some straws uh, at the supermarket. They even have that little crook in them. 
Well, I think they're too small. So I asked someone who was going out shopping if they wouldn't mind stopping at McDonald's and picking me up some straws because McDonald's does serve horribly sweet thick things that uh, you can drink out of a large straw. So I feel that uh, as long as I can shake, shake something, insert a straw and drink it, uh, that I'm all right. But uh, it makes me very angry that uh, it is the law that is forcing me to do this and uh, probably doing it months before it's really necessary. There will be people staying with me up to that point, people who are taking care of me. I can still uh, do some basic things and um, well, there's some messy things we won't talk about, but uh, um, these people will be going home, which is outside of Italy, and uh, their boarding passes will be proof that they left the country at a certain time and on a certain day. He'll probably end up staying in his wheelchair, and uh, um, he'll... Uh, um, he'll have all the, he'll be set up with, with a common catheter. So he'll be able to uh, devoid if he, if he needs to. And uh, um, his, barrel, his bowels will be cleared out. So he won't be able, so he won't have to, you know, defecate. And, um, um, and uh, leave him some, um, some food around so he can um, feed himself um, and some drinks, some fluids, and uh, basically set him up that way. And uh, and uh, he'll be uh, he'll be all set. I will have the video camera set up uh, with a film in it, ready to go. It has a remote control wide-angle lens will cover the room entirely and uh, after a sufficient amount of time has passed preferably I would uh, like to wait as long as uh, for them to arrive at their destinations then I'll simply film the whole thing and uh, so the, there will be no doubt uh, that uh, I did it myself. I'm also leaving in front of me all the documentation. My doctor's diagnosis, prognosis, uh, my will, my Italian will, which deals with the uh, taking care of house cleaning after the, the business. I've actually gone to visit a crematorium here to find out how much it costs. And uh, that was an interesting experience. And uh, uh, I was a little naughty when I left and said to the dear woman, who was quite kind, alla prossima volta. Uh, Till next time. The plan was formed months before Glenn thought it would be necessary to carry it out. Meanwhile, he continued to try to live a normal life, knowing that there was nothing the doctors could do. In some ways, he found this a consolation. This disease has some advantages. Again, given a menu of, God, I hate <laughs> That's a restaurant to avoid, but uh, given a menu of fatal diseases, uh, I find it rather nice that there's nothing the doctors can do because there are a whole lot of diseases where doctors can do all kinds of things that are excruciatingly uncomfortable or painful and they lose their patience in the end anyway. I did have uh, my doctor explain the 
advantages to feeding twos and uh, so on, but it didn't sound all that wonderful to me. And uh, your sight doesn't leave, but uh, in the end, most uh, about all you can do is blink. Uh, you can't speak. Uh, you can't breathe on your own. And uh, in other words, you lose most forms of communication. Uh, already now, I'm finding it difficult to find a position that I'm comfortable in. I'm not comfortable in this chair all day, but I'm not comfortable in bed either. And uh, so a few hours in one and I get a backache and uh, I have to go and sit in the other one. And, uh, but I can't imagine after I'm not able to sit in the chair, laying in bed, having a backache, and all you can do is blink. You can't even groan because you're on a bloody respirator. And uh, uh, to my mind, and uh, I have not been there, and I have no intentions of going there, but uh, I think it would drive me insane. And uh, insanity is not something I want to experience. I don't think there is anyone out there who hasn't considered dying in some way like this. Uh, there are probably as many people out there who've thought of terrible ways to die as there have people who've thought about winning the lottery. You know, it's just one of those things that people do think about and talk about. Um, I'd like to, them to think about it a little more carefully and uh, really realize the implications of it. It uh, uh, it's, it's not just pulling a plug. Uh, if it were that easy, I wouldn't be complaining. Uh, but it's, it's not just pulling a plug. And uh, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, it takes great planning. It, uh, it hurts people around you. And... Uh, uh, the whole idea of dying alone, I've thought of that a lot. Uh, but it's, it really is what I prefer almost at this point because uh, with something like this, the idea of uh, having anybody around or a room full of people in some other room, you know, knowing that this is going on, I mean, my God. And... Uh, and of course for myself, not even knowing how long it's going to take. I've actually chosen a date. And uh, um, there are more days and more hours in those days when I now wish it were all over. Uh, I just simply get so uncomfortable and it's harder and harder to find the joy. So uh, it really is time. And uh, there are more hours in those days when I worry that I've left it too late. So uh, there are some things I even practice to make sure I can still do them. And uh, it's, it's the hand. And uh, while I've still got three fingers and a thumb uh, to work with and um, uh, I've got to act now. On June the 5th, 1998, I flew to Rome to see Glenn and when I saw him in his apartment, I had a feeling that this would be the last time that we met. Something had changed about him. He was physically very depleted and the spark, that special spark he had, was gone. And he said, Miriam, I'm not enjoying life anymore. I hugged him. And I said, I don't know what to say, Glenn. And he said, there's nothing to say. It's all been said. 
And then he asked me to do something. He said, I want you to phone this apartment on Sunday, and if there's no reply, will you please call the concierge? So I did that, and there was no reply. And then I phoned the concierge, as, he, as he'd asked, and there was no reply there either, because it was a Sunday, and I suppose she was out for the day. So I tracked down his lawyer, Giuliano, whom I also met from CompuServe, and he got the landlord the next morning, and they opened the door, and they found Glenn dead. He'd killed himself by sucking the contents of the 60 pills that he'd saved through a McDonald's milkshake straw. For Giuliano, the discovery marked a particularly poignant moment in his life. Just the day before Glenn died, uh, uh, I became a father for the, f the third time um, of uh, a young girl which I call Virginia. And uh, what I find to be very beautiful is that Glenn strongly participated in this very joyful moment. And uh, a friend of his, uh, Margaret Coffin, told me that when, when she saw him uh, just the day before he committed suicide, he was asking about my daughter and he was, was worried that if he died, uh, I, I could be shocked and I couldn't be upset, I could be upset in my joy of be, having become, became a fa become a father. So it was, in a way, it was good that my daughter was born just the day before Glenn died because, you know, it's a sort of circle of life and uh, for a life that, uh, for a dear life that has gone, a dear life has come in and this is good, this is beautiful. The tape that Glenn had recorded of his own death had been removed by the police as evidence. Ten days after Glenn died, a few of his friends gathered in a hospital ward in Rome to the bizarre sound of lids being screwed onto coffins in adjacent booths. There was no religious service, Glenn didn't want that, but Giuliano read out a tribute from one of Glenn's students. Glenn challenged us and encouraged us and we pushed ourselves to do well because we couldn't bear to disappoint him with less than our best efforts. Uh, I had a very strong sensation of Glenn being there and of a whole lot of friends from all over the world being there because everybody knew about the gathering today. So a lot of people were going to be thinking of us today and I think they were all there with us. After the impromptu service, Glenn's body was taken to the crematorium he'd so carefully researched a few weeks before. As we talked among ourselves back at Glenn's apartment, there was a mixture of emotions. It's very strange not having him here and having left him in the, in the coffin in that very curious waiting room where we were. But in another way, of course, he is here because we read, we read bits of things that he'd written and his, his uh, personality is extremely strong. It won't die. And I don't feel solemn about his death. I feel great pride in his courage and um, focus. He was a cameraman and he had great focus in life and death. And I feel great relief that he was able to die the way he wanted. Before we all went our separate ways, we went to have lunch together at Glenn's favourite restaurant. Just your last, on June the 5th. And I think Glenn sat here. This meal marked the closure of a truly important episode in all our lives, apart from one final event. In April 1999, a copy of the tape of Glenn's last moments was handed to Giuliano Leme by the Rome police. For those of us who knew him, although it's difficult to watch, it is also evidence of his strength, his determination, 
and, in the end, his triumph. He had the Italian radio in the background, and irony of ironies, the DJ played Are You Lonesome Tonight, as Glenn experienced the loneliest moments of his life. When I kissed you and called you Before the drugs took effect, Glenn spoke haltingly about how and why he was taking his life. I want to die. I have done this myself. No one else is involved so-called Within a few minutes, Glenn fell asleep, and then he died. In spite of the fact that Glenn couldn't die in the way he really wanted, at the hands of a caring doctor, the tape showed that the plan he'd made nine months previously had succeeded, down to the last detail. I don't think about what I'm going to miss because I'm not going to be around to miss it. So missing isn't, doesn't come into the picture. I do think about uh, other people's pain. They're the ones who are going to be around uh, missing, but not me.